Welcome to today's presentation on nanowire solar cells. This is an exciting new technology that has seen a lot of investment and research in the past decade, and I'm excited to share it with you. It has the potential to vastly reduce the materials and energy required for solar cell fabrication, while maintaining similar efficiencies to conventional solar cells. This presentation has three main sections. First, device physics. Here, we'll discuss the nanowire geometry in detail, and the effects that it has on solar cell performance. We will pay especially close attention to the physical mechanisms that differ from the behavior of conventional planar solar cells. Next is history. The history of nanowire solar cells is the history of nanofabrication. So in this section, we'll cover the main nanowire synthesis processes and how they've changed over the years. We'll also discuss some benchmark devices and experimental results in different time periods to give context to the research that's happening today. Finally, we'll talk about sustainability. Could these devices help us achieve cheap, clean energy for everyone? We'll discuss the potential impacts of nanowire photovoltaics from social, environmental, and economic perspectives. Before we can understand the physical advantages of nanowire solar cells, we need to understand what they are. These devices can use the same materials as traditional solar cells, such as silicon or gallium arsenide, but instead of a bulk planar configuration, it's formed into arrays of tightly packed, small-scaled wires. These nanowires typically range in diameter from 10 nanometers to 1 micron. Considerable research has also been done on single nanowire cells, and these are useful for understanding the physical mechanisms going on in a nanowire. However, since the photocurrent is dependent on the surface area, all of the practical devices that have been demonstrated for non-concentrated light have used arrays of many nanowires. These devices will be the focus of this video. Of course, it's still necessary to form a junction when using nanowires. There are two main configurations for PN junctions in these devices, and it all comes down to the geometry of these rods. In radial junction cells, the core of each cell is doped with either acceptors or donors. This core is then surrounded by a shell of material that's doped in the other direction, forming a junction. Outside of the nanowire, these materials are insulated from each other and contacted with separate electrodes to achieve carrier collection. Axial junction solar cells, on the other hand, are much more similar to conventional solar cells. Here, the PN junction is formed by applying one layer of acceptor-doped material and one layer of donor-doped material on top of each other. Each nanowire acts like its own tiny solar cell. These configurations have very different effects on many of the properties we will discuss, such as charge transport and carrier collection. However, the most significant impact of the nanowire geometry is largely independent of these configurations. Absorption. Let's remind ourselves why absorption is important in solar cells. In the idealized case, the short circuit current is directly proportional to the flux of absorbed photons. This flux of absorbed photons is just the difference between the incident flux and the transmitted flux for photons with energies above the material's band gap. This transmitted flux can be predicted through the Beer-Lambert law. As a result, the absorbed photon flux is related to the absorption coefficient through an exponential decay, as shown. So as the absorption coefficient of a cell rises, so does the fraction of photons that it will absorb. This corresponds to higher short circuit current and higher efficiency. Losses from non-ideal absorption come from two major factors, reflection and transmission. The nanowire geometry can address both of these losses, as we will see. Consider a bulk silicon solar cell. Silicon has a higher refractive index than air, so while some incident light will enter the cell and become available for absorption, some of it will also reflect. This energy is lost. In bulk planar silicon, this can be a loss of up to 30%. It's possible to mitigate this by applying a layer with an intermediate refractive index to act as an anti-reflection coating. However, this will only work perfectly at one wavelength. For ideal anti-reflection, we would want a continuous gradient of refractive index between the air and the silicon. This is hard to achieve in bulk materials, but it can actually be done using nanowires. Consider the case of these tapered nanowires that are very thick near the substrate, but very thin at the ends. 
These are also sometimes referred to as nanocones. These can actually be used to achieve a continuous gradient in refractive index. Consider how the refractive index changes as we move from the air down towards the substrate. At the top, very little of the cross-sectional area is occupied by the nanowires, so the refractive index is close to that of air. As we move down, the area occupied by the wires goes up, so the effective refractive index increases. This allows for a smooth transition for light entering the material. Anti-reflection only accounts for part of the absorption improvement. Once the light has entered the device, light trapping effects are used to maximize the absorption efficiency. This comes down to two effects, optical resonances of the nanowires and an increase in the mean free path of a photon before it can exit the device. The nanowire diameter can have a big impact on the resonances available, but the biggest effect comes from the nanowire orientations. Randomly oriented arrays present a good Lambertian surface, but ordered vertical arrays can actually increase the mean free path considerably. This means that instead of transmitting out of the material, a given photon will undergo lots of scattering events, making absorption more likely. These effects have been demonstrated in research cells. Nanowires have consistently better absorption than planar films of the same thickness, caused both by the anti-reflection and the light trapping properties. Tapering the nanowires into nanocones further enhances this effect, with absorption values close to 1 for a large portion of the visible spectrum. This effect also minimizes reflection for light at off-normal incidence. When a planar surface sees a steady decline in absorption as the incident angle increases, Tapered nanowires remain high absorption values well above 45 degrees. Once a pair of charge carriers have been excited by a photon, they need to be separated and collected before recombination can occur. This is where the different junction geometries come into play. Consider an axial junction nanowire. The average charge carrier needs to move pretty far in the axial direction to cross the junction before it can reach a contact and be extracted. This distance is much lower in the radial junction nanowire, where the charges just have to hop from the outer film across the narrow junction. However, it's not all good news for the radial junction. Saturation current is dependent on the surface area of the junction and has a large impact on the open circuit voltage. According to this equation, the open circuit voltage will decrease with an increase in saturation current. The radial junction nanowire clearly has larger junction surface area than the axial junction, leading to an increased saturation current and decreased open circuit voltage. These priorities of charge separation and carrier collection need to be carefully balanced when selecting a nanowire geometry. All the considerations described so far work, even with relatively large nanowires. However, as the nanowire diameter gets smaller and smaller relative to the de Broglie wavelengths of the carriers, quantum confinement effects come into play. First of all, this leads to some discretization of the density of states for carriers in the material, enhancing their absorption cross-sections. It also allows for enhanced charge separation mechanisms in tapered nanowires. Since the carriers near the top experience a greater degree of confinement than the carriers at the bottom, it creates an intrinsic potential difference that can further enhance efficiency. These effects have been demonstrated in single nanowires, and it's only a matter of time before they are exploited in more practical devices. It's time to talk about where these devices come from, both in terms of their history and how they are manufactured. In the 1990s, many researchers believed that nanowire geometries had the potential to enhance the efficiency of photodiodes. This was around the time that quantum wire and quantum dot geometries were being integrated into lasers and LEDs, so there was a lot of interest in nanostructured electronic components. A few early labs were able to make arrays of nanowires exhibiting some of the desired properties, but their ability to fabricate nanowires was fundamentally limited. This all changed around the turn of the century, with the rapid improvement of two processes that are still used in nanowire fabrication to this day, chemical vapor deposition and patterned chemical etching. The chemical vapor deposition process begins with a substrate that has been infused with metal catalyst nanoparticles, often gold colloids. This substrate is placed in a furnace in the presence of precursor vapors for the semiconductor material. In the case of our animation, this is gallium and arsenic. 
As the vapors interact with the gold nanoparticles, they form a liquid eutectic and begin to precipitate. This continues as the nanowires grow vertically from the substrate. Patterned chemical etching is another growth process that uses photolithography or electron beam etching. After the nanowires have been grown, dopants can be introduced through diffusion or the deposition of a thin film. In either case, the temperatures and doping times must be carefully controlled to ensure consistency of the dopant concentration. With these new techniques available and being constantly improved, researchers were able to fabricate and test both single nanowire cells and arrays of many nanowires. Between 2005 and 2010, strong efficiency improvements were being reported in these devices every year. However, their efficiencies were nowhere near the efficiencies of planar cells. The most efficient nanowire cells reported in the period had efficiencies of around 2%, compared to commercially available panels with efficiencies of around 10%. Over the next five years, nanowire arrays became competitive with planar solar cells in terms of their efficiency. A gallium arsenide array was reported in 2015 with an efficiency of 15%. This is the dream of nanowire solar cells, efficiency comparable to existing materials, but drastically reduced material consumption and cost. Around this time, researchers also began exploring nanowire arrays using novel materials such as perovskites. This trend has continued through 2020 with strong efficiency gains year over year. While they're not currently practical for large-scale power generation, single nanowire solar cells have been demonstrated exceeding the Shockley quasar limit at efficiencies over 40%. More promising for immediate implementation are research trends in other adaptations of the nanowire geometry. Tandem junction nanowire solar cells, organic-inorganic hybrid cells, and nanowire cells enhanced with scatterers have all demonstrated efficiencies between 15 and 20%. Finally, let's talk about the sustainability of these devices. It's important to consider every aspect of their potential impacts, so we will discuss sustainability using a triple bottom line approach – social, environmental, and economic. The main impact of these devices is to reduce the material consumption required in solar cell fabrication. There are clear social benefits to this. Many of the materials commonly used in solar cell fabrication, such as gallium arsenide and gold, are considered conflict minerals. Reducing our reliance on these could potentially mitigate the exploitative labor practices where much of this extraction occurs. There are also social considerations on the consumer side. Reducing the cost of solar energy could make it more accessible to low-income earners, reducing the gap between those who can afford solar installations and those who cannot. From an environmental perspective, the solar cell life cycle is the main concern. Compared to conventional units, nanowire solar cells would use less material for initial fabrication and also have the potential to be recycled up to 100 times before disposal. There are concerns of toxic materials leaching from e-waste, but this is negligible compared to the toxicity produced in fossil fuel generation. It's also the same as regular solar cells. Finally, this technology could potentially reduce the cost of solar energy. Estimates of the levelized cost of electricity for nanowire technology range from 30 to 60 cents per kilowatt hour, but these don't take into account recent extremely high efficiency results that have been demonstrated. In summary, nanowire solar cells can enhance the absorption, charge separation, and carrier collection processes in photovoltaics. This allows them to achieve similar efficiencies to conventional cells using a small fraction of the material. They can be fabricated using chemical vapor deposition or patterned chemical etching. It is unclear whether these devices will ever be used for large-scale electricity production. However, it's certain that the lessons learned in their development will be instrumental in the improvement of our global energy network.